Thank you for being here. Wow, yeah. I'm so impressed. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Celebrity in the front row. I'm Sarah Grady of British Pastor Leather, and I'm going to start the session today with a quick explanation of what that is and what that means. And then, as you can see, we have a very large and dynamic panel, so we have a lot to talk about. And um, this is not going to be a series of presentations or even really a q and A. I'm really hoping for a very interactive discussion and invite also your voices into it. So um, even prior to a Q&A session at the end, if there's something you want to interject, catch my eye. We have a roving mic. I'd really like to have some general discussion here. So, okay. British Pasture Leather is the enterprise that I have co-founded with Alice Robinson. And our, there we go. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> our vision has been to create a new supply of leather that is made from the hides of cattle raised on regenerative farms in the UK. I have a background in many creative projects and media and to some extent also in food and agriculture and Alice is a trained fashion accessories designer and we joined together because we had both recognized the disconnection between leather as a material and agriculture despite the fact that leather is a product of our food system. So it comes from farms that are raising cattle for beef uh, and yet farmers don't know the destiny of the hides from their cattle herds and nor do designers have the option to know really anything about the farming practices uh, behind the origins of the material that they're choosing and they're working with. So I just want to speak a little bit about how the conventional or standard leather supply chain works which is that when farmers and many of you know this, take their cattle to the abattoir. They will receive back, of course, the carcass, the meat, but what is called the fifth quarter, which is everything beyond the four quarters of the carcass, is sold by the abattoir, unless the farmer requests to have it back. Um, and in the case of hides, those are purchased from the abattoir, not from the farmer, by a hide trader who aggregates and collects numerous hides from various sources and then those get redistributed to processors and tanneries around the world. So immediately at the point from the abattoir forward there's a, an, an anonymity that comes now with the hide and the hide is really considered a, a commodity raw material. So for farmers like those that are part of this community who are taking great care and putting tremendous resource into the uh, raising of their animals, there's no option really to know what happens to the hide. So that is one of the things that Alice and I set out to solve. Um, another motivation for us was really wanting to ensure that all parts of the animal are meaningfully used. And so we have had the very good fortune to partner with Pasture for Life. Two uh, leaders of Pasture for Life are on this panel today, so you'll hear more about that in a moment. But in terms of how we operate, different from what I just described, we start by identifying farms that are certified by Pasture for Life, recognizing that that is the highest standard of ecological farming practice and uh, animal welfare. And then we have identified abattoirs that serve multiple certified farms and we arrange for the collection of those hides from those abattoirs, maintaining the records to allow us to ensure the traceability of those hides back to those farms. And then those hides go into a traditional tanning process here uh, in Britain. So we have, again, had the very good fortune to partner with a traditional tannery that uses a process called vegetable tanning that has nothing to do with vegetables. It means that the tannins used to transform the hide into leather are derived from natural barks and leaves. And um, we'll talk more in a moment about the tanning infrastructure in Britain and the significance of our local production. But um, carrying on from there, what Alice and I do that's a bit different, again, from the um, typical production of a British vegetable tanned leather is that we then relocate the unfinished leather to a finishing, sorry, finishing facility that enables us to produce a range of finished styles so that that 
the, the leather material that we are producing would be suitable to a range of design applications, including accessories and furniture and footwear. Oh, sorry, a bit of a jumpy little clicker. Okay, let's go there. <laughs> um, this is an image of a show that we mounted uh, last fall to give um, demonstration, to, to demonstrate what is possible with the leather that we're making. So uh, a group of brands and designers each made one-of-a-kind products or prototypes with the leather that we had produced from the hides of Pasture for Life certified farms. And um, that included some very iconic brands like Mulberry, also represented on this panel here, as well as Bill Amberg, who's here with us today, who made that beautiful chair, renowned British leather craftsman. And... Um, you might recognize those trainers as well. So uh, uh, we were able to show what's possible. And just in terms of where we stand right now with our enterprise, we have now established these systems. We've proven what we can make. And we're now working to get purchasing commitments and partnerships from brands and designers who will use this leather for their own products. Um, so that is an explanation of what we're doing just to set the tone, set the stage for us here. And now I'm going to ask the panel to introduce themselves and then I've got a few questions to get us started with chatting. So Alice Robinson, my co-founder of British Pasture Leather. Hello. Um, hi, I'm Alice Robinson. I trained as a designer at the Royal College of Art. Um, my interest in leather really started there back in 2017. Um, having worked uh, primarily with garments, I started to work with leather and create accessories. And my first question was, where has this leather come from? I grew up as a part of a rural farming community in Shropshire on the border of North Wales from a um, farming family. My father was a farm vet and so I found it really um, quite astounding that some of the questions I had about this material that was so um, representative of the life of an animal couldn't be answered and um, couldn't be connected to the community that I had um, grown up around and had looked to for reassurance in many of the choices I was making about food and now wanted to direct myself as a designer to make those same choices about fibers. Great, thanks. I'm just gonna call you guys out, Jimmy. Thanks, hi, this is working. Hi everyone, I'm Jimmy Woodrow. I'm the executive director at Pasture for Life and been working very closely with Alice and Sarah for the past couple of years. And I think it's probably been the most exciting thing I have been working on for the past couple of years. I think the, the kind of profound sense of excitement when you connect farmers to fashion designers is something that we, we need a lot more of. I think it's, it's, it's kind of, it's a disconnect which seems um, possibly even greater than what we have seen in food and farming. And actually my personal journey, I've, I've, I'm not a farmer. I've come at this from the food industry myself. And I think there's a very similar journey there of tracing things back to source that I've, that I've gone on, which I see in what Sarah and Alice are doing. And I think I see in a lot of the, the fashion designers on, on the panel here and in the audience. And um, I think there's, there's, there's great potential in this. I think there's something about the, the loss of infrastructure, particularly, which is true as you know, true in abattoirs, but also tanneries, which is, is challenging the small farming model. And I think that's, that gets me going, that keeps me purposeful on a daily basis. And that's one of the reasons I love working with these guys. Oh, great, thank you. How about Rosie? Hi, everyone. Is that working? Yeah. Um, so I'm Rosie Wallacott Phillips, and I'm head of sustainability at Mulberry, the luxury uh, British brand. So 90% of the products that we sell contain leather. And in 2021, we committed to transforming our leather supply chain into one which is supporting regenerative production, hence why we've been uh, in discussions with Sarah and Alice for a number of years. Um, we understand the importance of traceability and the provenance of our products and delivering that information to our consumers. And currently, we're not able to uh, get an enough of a message across with our conventional leather uh, supply chains, which is why we're really, really excited to be part of this conversation. Thanks. Actually, um, I just want to make sure I just brought this slide up. I want to make sure we come back to the made to last manifesto, okay. but we'll get to that. Okay, one. sorry. Um, all right, Jack. Hi, I'm Jack. Uh, I'm the founder of a business called Billy Tannery, which is a 
uh, a leather business that uh, started with me building a, a small tannery on, on my family farm in Leicestershire. Uh, essentially, I found out that there were no goat skins being tanned in the UK, so there were thousands, hundreds of thousands going to waste each year, which inspired me basically to drop a career in marketing in London, come back to the farm and try and work out how to, how to tan leather on a farm. Um, that quickly snowballed into trying to control the whole supply chain and launching a range of uh, leather accessories made from goat leather that we're tanning on the farm. Um, today, I mean, it's nearly it's coming up to sort of eight, nearly 10 years later. Uh, it's grown a lot and the uh, what started in goats has moved into a big focus on deer leather. There are uh, more deer in the UK at the moment than there have been um, for the last sort of two million years or something. So there is a big opportunity to turn the wasted skins from um, from venison production into leather and that's a big part of what I'm focusing on at the moment is how to uh, how to do that as alongside the goat leather that, that we're tanning. Great, thank you. Alex? Hi, yeah. Um, <coughs> so I'm, I'm Alex McIntosh. I'm, I always really struggle to introduce myself. So uh, I'll try and keep it relatively simple. I, I come from a kind of uh, creative direction and branding background, but about 20 years ago, I, I came to the conclusion that I wanted to do something a bit more positive with that work and and to work with businesses to try and um to try and see if business can actually be potentially a force for some kind of good um in society uh i i worked a lot with fashion brands and so that became my focus so for about the last 20 years i've been looking at what is possible in terms of maybe making the fashion industry connect back to nature in in a a, a more meaningful way um, I, I run an agency now, so we work with a lot of different um, brands and retailers, one of whom is Mulberry. So we work very closely with Mulberry on the Made to Last Manifesto. But yeah, fundamentally, m my work is really is driven from the fact that I, I sort of believe that everything, everything in the fashion industry is dependent on nature. So if we don't have an industry that is, is driven by that ideology, we have no purpose. Thank you. Arizona. Hi, my name is Arizona Muse and I'm the founder of Dirt Charity and my story is that I've been a model for a long time in the fashion space and about nine years ago I realized, hmm, I don't know where these clothes are coming from. Where do they come from? I asked. Nobody knew either. And uh, I went on a deep dive and self-education journey to understand the fashion supply chain and of course I was brought back at the, th the end of every single story to soil. Fashion is grown in soil, I was surprised to learn by farmers and this started my real passion for farming. It's now my end all life ambition to become a farmer. I absolutely love it. And uh, DIRT, the charity that I started is the culmination of what turned into climate activism. I love my life as a climate activist and that's one important thing I wanna share with everyone. Just changing life from something really boring like modeling into something really exciting like climate activism has been the most amazing personal journey. And at DIRT, we work on soil regeneration with an emphasis on non-food crops like silk, wool, leather, all the things that we use in fashion and interiors that until very recently slash now are, are still kind of not really... <laughs> we, we haven't changed that aspect of agriculture enough yet. For instance, we work very closely with the biodynamic farming movement who has Demeter as their global certifying body. Demeter has seen great success certifying food and wine, but they don't yet certify all of the fashion materials. So we're working with them to create 10 new certifications for all the materials that we use, including tree fibers and all the random things that you don't really think of when you think of your clothes, but we use them all. Uh, so that's some of the work that we're doing. Thank you, Nikki. Was that for me? Thanks, I haven't even said anything. <laughs> Um, hi folks, my name is Nikki Oxall. I work with Jimmy at Pasture for Life. My job there is head of research. Um, so I support uh, the link between academic researchers and farmers to um, kind of build an understanding and improve our understanding of 100% pasture fed ruminants, uh, predominantly in the UK, but we also work with uh, academics across the EU as well. Um, I'm also a farmer. I farm in Northeast Scotland in Aberdeenshire and um, an amateur tanner um, so we do a little bit of on-farm home uh, hair on high tanning as well so um, really delighted to be part of this of this panel and slightly intimidated by the very cool fashion people here. 
not thanks. my normal not my normal place thanks well thanks to all of you for that and actually um i will just add to that to say how exciting it is to see these different communities in these different sectors coming together here at groundswell and um oh really that's what what are you seeing on that screen yeah let's go back to the the last slide yeah <laughs> Um, uh, you know, there, there are, as I said before, there are many people here in the audience for this talk who I think would not normally attend Groundswell, but who are here because of this intersection of, of interests and issues. And I find that really exciting and, um, and again, hope that we can uh, hear from, from many of you as well today. So, okay, so getting right into it, I'm going to turn to my co-founder, Alice, and ask the question, yeah, and we don't have quite enough mics, so we'll be sharing mics a bit. Ask the question, why leather? Um, well, for me it was that leather is, in the fashion industry, elevated to be a luxury product, um, but it has no association to the agriculture it comes from. But when you look at leather, it is the most um, evocative emblem, emblem of the life of an animal that has, um, in the case of cattle leather or sheep leather, been reared for food and is tied to a farming community and an impact um, on land. And so for me, that is a very um, sort of powerful starting point to think of from a, from a design perspective of, of why do we need to associate leather more closely to the farming community that it comes from. Yeah, great. And so um, one of the things that Alice and I often um, talk about and we're very motivated by is the desire to be able to make a distinction um, between an anonymous material, or in many cases food, that might come from an industrialized system as opposed to one that we can know comes from a regenerative system that has had tremendous benefit. So my next question is for Jimmy and Nikki. Why 100% pasture fed? Want to take that first? Yeah. Okay. Um, what I think what, what what I would like to say, Nikki's going to talk about the farming itself, but I think it, f from my perspective, it would be a mistake to see this as people with big wallets paying more for expensive things, and that's the solution. I think actually, why we're working together is because it's it's about community. I think the I think the intractable problems we have in society, particularly in farming need community approaches and I think what's drawn Sarah and Alice to Pasture for Life is we're a community, we're not only farmers, we're butchers, chefs, leather workers, mm -hmm. conservationists, vets, academics and it's that kind of co-creation of solutions which is wh which not only gives you the right solution at the end of the road but also I guess helps people enjoy the journey um, and so, for example, Andy Rumming, who's one of our certified farmers, was instrumental in getting this off the ground because he did all the salting of the early hides. He, did that, he, he essentially did that off his own back, really. If we hadn't had Andy, this might not have happened. Andy's, uh, Andy's over there. Yeah. Cheers to Andy. <laughs> um, and, and there have been lots of, lots of stories like that in, th in, the, in the journey that we've all been on that have been integral to its success. Um, I, I, you know, we... We helped Alice and Sarah with some funding at the beginning. It, we, we didn't give them the funding, but we helped them access the funding because we were an established company. Um, and I think, for me, that's the magic of this. Mm. It is also about the farming, and Nikki's going to talk about the farming, but um, you know, you see that at Groundswell. It is, it is about relationships. It's about mm. personal connections, and that's what we do at Pasture for Life, and that's what we're looking to kind of incubate in working with people like Alice and Sarah. Thanks. So that gives you a bit of an understanding of kind of how, how Pasture for Life works as an organisation and how community focused we are. But, you know, as I said already, our focus is 100% pasture fed ruminants. Now, um, you may or may not be aware that ruminants co-evolved with grasslands um, and are beautifully adapted um, by just perfect evolution to be able to grow, particularly think of the size of a cow, to grow to that size only eating pasture. It's quite impressive, and they do that because they are able to ruminate, which is essentially to kind of 
digest grass multiple times and, and, and access as much as they possibly can, protein and fibre from that, um, from that green material. Um, and many, uh, it within the UK, often people talk about, you know, this is grass-fed beef or grass-fed lamb, and that actually means that it potentially has only been fed 51% grass. As long as it's slightly over half, then you're allowed to call it grass-fed. So our focus is on um, kind of putting ruminants back to their roots, essentially, um, and ensuring that they are having a 100% pasture diet. Um, so that's grass, like you'll see out here. Um, it could be the herbal lays behind uh, behind this tent. There's a beautiful um, chicory-rich herbal lay um, on display. They might be eating that in the winter. They could be eating um, hay or haylage or silage. But essentially, these animals are not, not being fed grains. And they're not being fed any concentrate made from soy. And now we all, I'm sure, are aware of the challenges of um, the environmental impacts of things like soy coming from, um, uh, you know, the global south and, and issues around extraction of that and the damage to the landscapes that happens where that's taken from. Um, and even feeding grain can, um, you know, extend the kind of amount of land use that's required and, and, and bringing arable systems into feeding livestock, which, as I've said, are perfectly adapted to eat grass. Um, and actually, we could potentially be using some of that land to feed to feed people um, uh, directly, uh, and we potentially could also be, if we needed to have grains in, into the food system for livestock, would be uh, ideally for monogastrics like pigs and poultry. So that's kind of a broad reason why you know we are promoting 100% pasture-fed ruminants because that's what ruminants were designed and have evolved to eat. Um, and we also find through our research that. Um, pasture for life farms tend to have more diverse pastures, more diverse swards, um, both in terms of the sward structure. So sward is basically a fancy name for grass and all the other plants that you find in that pasture. Um, so we tend to find that they have a, a, a more diverse structure, so some tall stuff, some short stuff. That means you get lots of insects living in there because of loads of habitat, which means an uplift in the amount of birds and small mammals. So suddenly, just by thinking about management of pasture in a slightly different way because that's all that animal's going to eat we end up with more diverse swards structurally and species wise so we get a really rich species um, mix within that sward and we're seeing those aggregated environmental benefits adding up so that we are confident that the animals that are coming out of these systems systems are not only producing really nutrient dense beef there's some fantastic research that highlights the um, the benefits of 100 percent pasture raised and finished meat in terms of the omega-3 to omega-6 ratios, and we can talk about that in more detail a bit later on if that's in of interest, um, but making sure that then that fifth quarter, which also benefits from that environmentally um, positive rearing, is able to then go into the system um, and be recognised for, for the high quality that it is. Great, thank you. Yes, yeah, so this idea that um, grazing animals actually improve soil and help us to look after land and to steward land is again one of the things um, that Alice and I are working to bring into the conversations that we get to have with designers and, and in the um, fashion and design communities really to bring that awareness into our material culture. Um, and so we like to call that embedded value. So that, that positive impact that those animals and those farmers have had on land and biodiversity and food systems is part of the value that we see in the leather that we're producing. And to Jimmy's point about collaboration, I'm gonna turn now to some of the fashion uh, industry voices on our panel, Alex, maybe this one will come to you, um, which is you know one of the, um, trickier aspects of our development right now is that the leather that we are producing from these systems entirely locally, entirely in Britain, and based so much on relationships, as Jimmy said, with collaboration, is more expensive than its commodity counterpart. And um, so, Alex, if you can speak to this question of democratiza democratization, how do we deal with that pricing conundrum? Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I set the context for this a little bit because others will have something to say about this for sure. Um, <coughs> we have a lot of conversation going on in the fashion industry. I'm sure many people are aware of it. That you know the 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 fashion the fashion should be democratic. It should be available to everyone, which I don't disagree with. You know, we all wear clothes, and we should all be able to wear clothes and have access to them. But there's a kind of notion within that that it should be um, cheap in a way that I think is is not realistic and it doesn't reflect the actual the value that has been embedded into the things that you're using and wearing or it, it could be applied to many other 
products and commodities in our life. So I guess the, the argument about democracy is, is closely associated to an argument about quantity versus quality. Um, and we, we do exist in a space in the fashion industry at the moment where we expect uh, quantity to be the main driver. And I think we have to move back into a space where our expectation is quality, because let's be frank, most of us could open our wardrobes and see many, many things in them that we one, never wear and two, really don't need. There's very few people who, who simply are in a position where they just don't have enough clothing. There are some and, uh, you know, that has to be addressed as well. But on the whole, we are consuming more than we need. So th if we're going to move into a space where we, we add more value back into things, we have to accept that we have to reflect the real cost of making them. Um, and that I think is is a conversation that has to happen. Um, it has to keep happening, and and it's it's perhaps not as much as it should. Yeah, great. Thank you, Alice. Did you have something you wanted to add to that? No. Okay. <laughs> um, how about Rosie? Do you want to talk about this this issue that we're? Yeah, sure. Um, so I've been at Mulberry a long time, 13 years, and I've been five years working in the sustainability function. And I think that if you asked me five years ago that if I would be happy to sit on a, a stage at a farming and agriculture festival, I would have been a little bit confused. But actually, it's because of the learning that the fashion brands are trying to do. We are trying to get under the skins of our supply chain. So hand on heart, we always source beautiful, high quality leather from incredible tanneries. But now we are really, really starting to push backwards into the supply chain and as Sarah and Alex have alluded to that comes with a cost because we have a responsibility as a brand with huge net zero commitment to source our leather in a better way we no longer want to be just purchasing leather that looks good and feels good and lasts a long time we want to be doing a little bit better and it's been challenging internally we are um, led by an amazing team of designers who are keeping up with all of the other fashion brands our competitors and they want the you know beautiful bright materials and they want it now and actually that's not how the leather industry should work it should be more about the relationship building and the communities so yeah i'm obviously incredibly pleased to be here but it's definitely not what i thought when i took the job <laughs> arizona did you want to chime in on this sure it's uh, what's coming to mind is we also have a massive opportunity when it comes to redistribution of subsidies because right now the subsidies are really supporting old-fashioned ways of farming and ways of producing and as soon as we get that sorted out and look at it look at it, the opportunity that we have there to bring money into the right places to incentivize the right decisions we could definitely have a different cost for all of the materials that we buy that are grown on farms I just to sort of bring it back to the context of why that's a challenge for us is that um, globally far more hides are produced than what the leather industry uses so as the scale of um, meat production has stayed the same or increased the interest in leather has gone down over comparatively and um, whilst hides that come from farms and come out of abattoirs aren't associated to the agriculture that they come from so in the way that we have aggregation in food between um, meat that has come from more of an industrial farm or that has traceability to organic or pasture fed farms in leather that sort of differentiation does not happen and so to put that in place is where the challenge begins because those hides are treated as very very cheap commodities that is dictated by a global hide market so to try to say we want to attribute more value to that that really knocks on to the effect of what is treated as a very cheap and um, abundant material globally yeah, and I think, and you you found a statistic from the American hide. So yeah, the Leather Hide Council of America has a statistic that is illustrative because it's based on incomplete data, but they um, estimate that in America, 50% of the hides that are produced from cattle farms go into landfill or incineration, and globally around 45% of all hides globally are not used for various reasons, which we can touch on later. Great, thank you. Nikki, you wanted to add something? 
Yeah, I just, I just wanted to talk about the cost element and kind of um, Arizona brought that back to farms. What we actually find is on pasture for life farms, cost of production is, is really low because the farms are maximizing uh, a natural essentially resource and harnessing the sun's power to grow grass. Um, so, so we do find when we do economic assessments, actually the cost of producing um, that animal, for example, is significantly lower than it is for farms that are um, bringing in, in terms of inputs, is significantly lower than bring farms that are bringing in kind of uh, whether that's uh, extensive fertilizer or whether it's um, feed inputs. Actually, the, the challenge, and for myself as a, as a farmer, the challenge for me is in the localized processing. Um, so for us, whether it's you know producing beef, that's the, the biggest cost line on for us in our finances is about you know using a local butcher, for example. And it would be the same within um, f for, th for this kind of, for, th for, for leather, is actually the cost of production of that animal is, l is fairly low. Mm. The cost challenge comes post-slaughter. Yeah. Um, yeah. which is which is really frustrating because that's the bit that is then stopping the farmers potentially from from being able to engage with that process and the logistics which you guys have obviously been working on yeah that's that's a great analogy and helps us I think go into a little bit of a discussion about leather production and leather making you know one of the commitments that Alice and I have made with British pasture leather is to produce entirely in Britain and leather as an industry is highly globalized um, so, you know, most of the leather that we are familiar with in our bags, belts, shoes has actually traveled around the world quite a lot before it lands in our hands as a finished leather product. But in this case, we are working obviously with British regenerative farms. We are, as I mentioned, working with a British tannery that uses a traditional process of tanning that takes longer um, than the method that most leather in the world is made with. Um, and that has presented us with a lot of challenges because the globalization of this industry means that the infrastructure here in the UK has withered. Very similar to the conversation we have about abattoirs. Um, uh, once upon a time, there were many more tanners and uh, many more services available. So that is one of our challenges in terms of um, you know cost of production. And it's what led you, Jack, to your um, current path as a as a tanner and leather maker yourself and so I wonder if you could speak a little bit about uh, about this aspect of rebuilding recapturing the leather production industry here yeah definitely I mean the the whole reason that I've had to go down the path th that I have is because of the lack of infrastructure left in the UK uh, leather industry there uh, today I think in including what I'm doing on a very small scale on the farm there were maybe four vegetable tanneries five maybe in in the UK and what it's m what it means is it's very difficult for people trying to do uh, good things like this. You want to take the the hides and skins from farms doing things in the right way, turn it into leather. But the the task and what has taken me nearly a decade now to get to this point is is rebuilding what has fallen apart, which is the infrastructure from uh, farm to abattoir, to from abattoir to to tannery, um, because it, it it's very very hard, and it is a case of I'm, I'm having to sort of reinvent what was a very uh, natural process within within the system, um, and it's not easy because there's lots of rules and regulations that you have to find out about, and um, uh, just the, the physical nature of a uh, um, of the hides that have been salted is that they they will last a while, but they won't last forever. So you've got this sort of ticking time of getting it into leather before you, before you're then sure that you've, you haven't wasted it. So uh, yeah, I mean, I could talk for hours on the the complications of of setting up a tannery and how to how to make that supply chain work and it is a work in progress but yeah there's there's a lot of work that needs to be done because to if you if you're trying to bring the price down you need to make things more efficient but it, it's finding that balance between over industrializing the process you want to keep it in sort of artisan nature but it's still got to work financially well, I really f commend you for taking that on because you know it, it's a lot and there's many parts to it. And one of the things that um, aligns our work, Billy Tannery and British Pasture Leather, is that um, we're both in different ways really making the point that, again, leather is connected to our food, um, which is something that curiously gets overlooked by or um, obscured in the dominant conventional leather industry. And... Um, and I wanted to, to kind of come into this question around quality um, on that because 
um, we are, both Billy Tannery and British Pasture Leather, are really making an effort to produce leather that tells the story of that animal's life, as, as Alice said at the beginning. And so um, our hope is that that will enable an appreciation and an understanding of regenerative practices. And so it makes sense to us you know, to really let that natural character tell that story. But, but in fact, most leather, um, again, typically produced using, I think it's 80 or 90% of leather that's produced using chrome tannage around the world, which is a heavy metal that can potentially be toxic and polluting, but ultimately will not biodegrade in the finished leather. And um, that is one of the choices that, one of the things that we are choosing to avoid. Um, similarly, we are not adding a lot of chemicals or polyurethanes that would also inhibit the biodegradability of the leather. And most leather um, in the world is highly manipulated. So we actually have some examples of different leathers up here that we can show um, at the end of the talk. Um, but most leather that you might think has a natural grain may well not. It may have been embossed with a false grain that looks like a natural grain. And very often leather is coated with polyurethane or other coatings so that it will have a uh, kind of natural resistance to wear. Whereas the vegetable tan leather that we are making will age beautifully. It will show you its natural character. It will develop more character as it ages. Um, but we come up, up against very often a challenge in the industry that, um, that that natural character actually is a flaw, that it needs to be corrected. That is the, the technical term that's used in the industry when you add resins and coatings and embossings. And it's something that we've talked about a lot. I'm looking at Alex and Alice um, because we're often asking this question, how do we change those perceptions of quality? Um, and 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 essentially correct that <laughs> to so to really appreciate the the natural quality. So I wonder if if you guys could speak to that question a bit. Yeah, yeah. The uh, the real irony in in the fashion industry, anyway, is that everybody talks about wanting something unique, but actually we spend our whole time trying to make things completely standardized. So I suppose alongside democratization, democratization, we also have the problem of standardization and, and quality control. And, you know, many people are working in this industry who have a, a set of rules that they've been given through their entire professional lives. And, and they adhere to them because that is what they have been told they must do. And that has a knock on effect in that it creates an expectation with customers that things will be delivered to them in a very specific way and at a very specific quality level. And, you know, actually, uh, I think it doesn't speak to any of the things that fashion really is about, which is self-expression and individuality and, and all of those things that are, uh, I think, are really important to, to all of us. So, you know, I think quality is, a, is, a, is obviously a mutable term. You know, they're, they're different people have different interpretations of quality. But to me, we need to be moving to a place where we understand quality to be something that is to do with, the, you know, things having their unique characteristics. And the thing I thought was beautiful when I first saw Sarah and Alice's work was actually... The leather carries the, the physical story of the animal. Um, and that is, a, I think, a wonderful thing. And we need to find ways through the way we design and create product to celebrate that. Great. That was my next question. What is the role of the designer in that? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll let somebody else I'm going to let you guys just start chiming in. I was yeah, just going to add to that in that um, the way that Sarah and I are working is we are very much led by where the pasture fly farmers are taking the animals to which abattoir. So um, in the traditional leather industry, there's many different grading processes that put the quality of the grain of the hide when the hair has been removed into different um, quality levels. So the highest grade, uh, well, the highest quality of leather in, in the industry is, is keeping the full grain intact. So where there is very few blemishes and um, you can really see the depth of life, but without any imperfections. Our reality is is that we aren't grading anything. Our grading process is pasture for life certified cattle. And um, Nikki can explain sort of some of the um, places in which her cattle roam um, in Scotland. But I spend a lot of time over Instagram seeing the pasture for life farmers having their cattle through woodlands or, you know, rubbing up next to Hawthorne, ha Hawthorne hedgerows. And that character is what is what we then, by its term to the character in the leather, that um, the imperfections and the flaws, but that is um, sort of the beauty of it and trying to create a way in which we can design with that to um, elevate those um, 
those marks that is beautiful and can be perceived as beautiful and unique. Um, and I think that's a very exciting design challenge rather than a design flaw for leather. Yeah, and what, uh, what about the uncoated, the question of uncoated leather? Does anyone want to speak to that? Any of my leather voices? Well, <laughs> in terms of, in terms in terms of um, the way in which brands assume that their customers require a leather that has been essentially coated with plastic. I think to Alex's point earlier, the fashion industry has conditioned itself to this really standardized, consistent approach with leather that when we as a brand have anything that is outside of that box, our customers are not quite sure how to uh, how to approach it. So actually we have the responsibility now of retraining our customers into where leather comes from in truth and how to look after it as well. Because I think something we've not really touched on yet is the durability of this material. You can repair leather, you can take products apart, fix them and put them back together again. You probably wouldn't want to be doing that with and one of those many alternatives that is on the market. And actually, our, one of my colleagues, Nick, who's our head of quality, always says there's only one thing better than a new mulberry bag and that's an old mulberry bag. And it's because you start to see that natural breakdown, the oils coming through. You see the real uniqueness and it tells a story. And in our factory in Somerset, where I'm based, we repair over 12,000 bags every single year. And that's because people are attached to them. It's, it's their bag, it tells their story, their history. And the zip might have been bust or you know something really kind of non-material related has happened and they just want it to work again. So, so we will fix it and keep that product uh, in the circular ecosystem. And we're able to do that because it's leather. Can I add a layer of complexity to that? That so some many many sustainable fashion brands do a really great job communicating to their customers about imperfections about how the beauty of natural dye or vegetable tan leather and that's great but then you have retailers as well those brands often sell through a third party who might not care about their communication about the little imperfections so then you have consumers who are getting a product that doesn't meet their expectations and without any explanation and that's really, really hard and a big hurdle. And we need to, as an industry, address that and make sure that the retailers are on board with the ambition to explain why does it look a certain way and what's amazing about that and to promote that rather than a consumer by accidentally receiving this product that maybe they didn't order because of its sustainable uh, history. They just ordered it because they liked it and then didn't meet their expectations. Yeah, no, thank you. That's great because I think that aspect of confusion or, or you know, l lack of information. Also, you just mentioned leather alternatives, and that might be something for us to talk about here, which is that um, there are many new material innovations uh, producing leather-like materials that are not leather, but that are using the word leather, which is creating more confusion. Um, and one of the big challenges that we have, for example, is this notion of vegan leather, which is um, which can be made of many different things, but but very often is um, is a form of plastic, really. Uh, so I don't know if again, if if anyone wants to come in on that one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't want to always be the first person jumping in here, but I am. So there you go. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I think. Uh, look, I m my m I suppose my view on these things is that we have to have a diversity of solutions, and you know, when we know we're in an industry that has huge sustainability problems, we have to be looking at different ways to move towards a, a better model. And I think that that potentially uh, plant-based or um, non-animal-based leather alternatives do have some role to play but the reality is the way that they're made currently still involves the the, the inclusion of a large amount of essentially plastic in the construction because you, you need it to bind the material together most of the time so uh, i'm not anti it but i just don't think it's a singular thing i don't think we should be looking at the world in that way we have to be looking at it in a more open and more diverse way i used to be vegan i i, I i'm not anymore it's not that I'm in any way anti the, the vegan movement. It's just that I think that animals have a, a very important and essential role to play in, in our agricultural future. And therefore, leather is part of that conversation. So, you know. I, I was just going to chip in because I don't know if anyone else is thinking this, but if, if you change 10 words that we've said, you could be he hearing us talk about the food system. 
the structural issues are almost identical. The infrastructure issues, the, the, the retail issues, the imperfection issues, yeah, it's, it's all there. But we're talking about a subtly different bit of the, the food and farming system. And actually, one of, the, one of the more interesting things I've heard when I've been taken to these amazing events by Alice and Sarah over the last couple of years is, um, is that you know, with food, we have issues with cooking. No one knows how to cook anymore, so you have a kind of real systemic problem in the food system. With leather, I've, I, mean, I think it might have been Matthew who's over there from the, from the leather sellers company was saying that they've been funding art schools to use leather because it's quite an expensive product. And if there's no money at the art school, they don't have the ability to work, you know, for, for the students to work with the product. And that's a major problem. Then at another event, I actually bumped into a fellow dad at school. Um, and he's a tutor at the Royal College of Art. And he was saying he hears other tutors at the Royal College of Art encouraging their students not to use leather because it's not the right thing to do and they should be looking at alternatives. So we've, I mean, it's, it, it, you, you can go really deep on all of this. And there are issues everywhere. <laughs> yeah, no, that I think that, that that actually could lead us into another question that I had because, again, it comes back to the fact that our discourse around raising animals for food is very highly polarized. It, it really shouldn't be meat or no meat because we have another option to consider. So if we bring more nuance into that so that we can, ag again, as you said, Alex, appreciate the importance of grazing animals in landscapes that are suited to growing pasture and everything, Nikki, that you explained before about the, the benefit those animals bring. M my understanding is that a lot of the brands, and again, I'm going to look to sort of Alex, Alice, Arizona, Rosie, who are really working and, and have familiarity with some of the fashion industry issues and the design community, is that um, some of the brands, in order to adopt some of the shifts and the changes that we're proposing, require metrics and measurements and data to give evidence to that impact. And I'm wondering if we can talk a little bit about that, that issue, that issue um, for 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 um, inspiring the adoption of, of of these changes, and and I think Rosie, if you could speak to that, and Nikki as well, if you can talk about how those impact measurements. Yeah, so we're going to get quite broad now and think about um, brands' commitments to net zero and carbon reduction. So there's a lot of regulations and legislation that is rightfully so pushing businesses to um, really work hard on reducing their carbon impact. And to be able to do that, we need to have the metrics against the materials that we use to prove that the ones we are choosing are better than the conventional alternatives. So I know that not that long ago, I had a, a quick conversation with Sarah and Alice and said, how are we gonna measure on paper that when we have to count up the carbon accountability of our whole range for the last year, how are we gonna get that across and prove that what we're doing is better than of course, we know that because we've listened to all the amazing speakers and we understand it, but we have to be able to prove it as well. And it is a gray area for brands at the moment. There's there's not a lot of uh, data which we can rely on, which talks about the carbon impact of conventional leather. If you think about the industry metrics that it's probably been calculated on, some of those cows will never have stepped hoof on the grass before. Um, and we have to use that measurement because there's nothing more available to us. So there's a lot of work to be done there. Yeah, I think um, um, many people will know some of the challenges that we have around uh, carbon audits, carbon footprinting, LCA, so life cycle assessments, um, and the, the scope three emissions that, uh, that many of the brands like Mulberry are having to deal with. And that basically takes us back to the into the onto the farm. Um, and so I'm not going to kind of go off on one <laughs> about the potential inaccuracies of current uh, methane uh, metrics that are used because they, they are inaccurate for many types of farm systems and we just don't have enough research there um, that has been validated yet. We're working on it and we're getting there, but it's slow. And it, what's, what's frightening is that policy decisions are being made on data that isn't necessarily you know, reflecting what's actually happening on, happening on the ground. And we see this again and again and again in the farm system. The other thing that we're not able to accurately um, measure, but we're trying hard to, us and many other organisations across food and farming, um, is the, the, the use of animals as a tool for us to achieve other land management outcomes. So that could be, and if any of you are in a brilliant session that was held before this um, over in the dairy tent about um, 
uh, integration of, of livestock into arable systems. So that basically, if you're growing some crops, what you can do is you can bring animals onto that crop early on, which can help reduce the need for fungicides. Also, it can reduce the need for fertilizers. Or if after you finish growing your wheat or your barley crop, you can then have something called a cover crop, um, which normally has lots of flowers in it. And it's very beautiful, like some of the... the um, kind of mixed cover crops that are on display around the site today and then animals can come in and eat that and obviously their dunging and their urine will add fertility to the ground. What we do not have at the moment is is enough understanding of how those animals, so if that for if a cow, for example, goes and uh, is used as an ecosystem engineer, let's call it that, we don't have enough information to say this cow not only um, produced X amount of food, we can do that, this cow um, produced X amount of leather, we know that. What we're not able to say is, and it enabled a reduction of this much fertilizer, or it enabled a reduction of this much fungicide. And actually it also contributed to the growing of this much wheat, which then went into the food chain. So the complexity of our ecosystems is not accurately reflected in the metrics that we have. And we haven't either, we're not able at the moment to understand th how much that animal has uh, improved biodiversity. Uh, within Pasture of Life, we have a brilliant set of biodiversity case studies, thanks to the excellent work that John has been kind of really pushing for over the last couple of years, where many of our farms are saying, these are the changes we're seeing, this, these are the biodiversity shifts. We're now working with organizations like Nature Metrics and, um, and other uh, kind of data-driven businesses to help us to, to kind of put metrics to this, to understand the biodiversity gain of integrating animals into landscapes. But it's really early on and the science isn't developed enough, yet policy decisions are being made based on incomplete data sets. So that's the challenge where we are at the moment. And I would, I would urge all of you, you know, where you can to start digging deeper into these challenges. Thank you. Um, okay, so with several minutes left, we're going to um, move into hopefully some questions. I just want to say that, um, you know, a as you, I hope, are, are, are seeing and hearing, this is such a rich topic and discussion because we're touching on so many different things that are all intersecting in this question around leather material. So, um, you know, I wish we had more time. I'm very grateful to all the, all the voices that are here. Um, and would like to invite any questions. Looks like there's a question, Steve, right there. Uh, oh, um, it's my question. Oh, great. <laughs> Looking at it from the con consumer end, luxury consumer end, um, we want to eat pasta-fed beef um, because it's better, it tastes better, and it's better for you than beef grown in a feedlot in America, say. Um, it, you haven't touched on at all the actual quality of the leather mm. that comes from a pasta-fed animal as opposed to the worst form of production of, say, a beef lot in America. Is the any difference at all? I mean, there clearly is a difference in the meat. Is there any difference in the quality of the leather? Because if there is, surely that is the m one of your main drivers to encourage the luxury market to say, this is the creme de la creme because it's actually better leather. I or love this question. Alice, do you want to start? Depends what quality means. I was actually going to say, um, I don't know if Bill wanted to answer this one, ah. because actually you had a really great... Uh, Steve, sorry to pull you out, but here? I feel like you said it really well. I mean, I'm very happy to, <laughs> to answer, but... But Great that idea. Would be more interesting. So, um, Bill Amber, you can introduce yourself. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Bill. <laughs> One of our <laughs> friends and heroes. Uh, hello, yeah, yeah. I'm Bill Amber. Uh, I have a, uh, a leather design and manufacturing business uh, based in London um, for the last 40 years. Um, and we specialize in using material that is uh, vegetable tanned. Um, and comes from a reliable source where the farming has been of excellent quality. Um, and in answer to your question, which is a really interesting one and a simple one, um, the material is infinitely better. Um, a, an animal that's been f fed in a feedlot will have thin, veiny, awful skin. And um, an animal that's been out in a pasture will have beautiful, fat, lovely, plump skin. I mean, it's exactly the same as a human. You, you, see a, you see a person walking down the street and you can tell how healthy they are just by looking at them. And you can tell the health of a cow just by looking at it. And therefore their skin is, you know, it's a perfect example of their life. And therefore, w therefore also what you can make from it. Mm. 
And one of my questions, actually, which I'd like to pass back to you lot, is to Jack. Um, you know, we're talking about leather, and leather isn't actually the end product. Leather is, mm. is a material that you make things from. Mm. And I think that's one of the trip-ups. It's all very well making leather, but actually it's about the product. And, and Jack, as a tanner, I'd be interested to know how you, wha where you sit there. You're making leather, but you're also making product. You also must be in a position to think about where your leather should end up or could end up and, and trying to encourage people to think about different uses of materials outside the fashion industry. I mean, I don't, I'm not involved in the fashion industry at all. We're, we make oh, you know, floors, doors, walls, material, desks, all sorts of things, furniture, but I'd be interested to know what your feelings are. Well, yeah, thanks, Bill. I mean, the, what I've done with my business is to, uh, yes, we're tanning the leather, but I, I found pretty early on that the challenge of selling that leather, which is not what uh, someone buying lots of leather is used to seeing is, is really, really hard. So the way that I've approached it is to do the whole thing. So I not only will tan the leather, but I also um, have our, we have our own range of products and therefore control that. I, I c I'm controlling what, um, where the leather's going, what, what it looks like, and I'm not relying on what someone else's opinion of what good leather is. I can spend the time making what I think is good leather and then make it into products that that I think are right and then telling that story and I think it's easy for me to do that on a very small scale I think the challenge is how you approach that on the wider scale you suddenly to change the whole way Mulberry appro approaches selling um, their leather goods and to say look this is how it should be and this is what it is I, I, the benefit from what I'm doing is to start from scratch and say this is what it is and this is what um, the leather looks like and this is what you should be expecting it to look like and and yeah, I mean, it's still hard. You, I'm selling products online. Someone can look at a photo of one bag. Every bag looks different. So I ha it's a real challenge to say, look, the differences are the, the quality and try and get people on board with that so that you don't get a wallet coming back. Oh, there's a mark on this. And the, the answer is always th that is a natural mark and was on the animal. It's, it's not a mistake. Um, it's not a, a damage. And that, I think, is the, the, the challenge, I think. But yeah, it, <laughs> the way I do it is just to control the whole process. Thanks for both those questions. Steve, can we send the microphone to the back there? Thank you. Thanks ever so much. Uh, Claire McNichol from RBST. There were just two questions that I wanted to get the panel's opinion on. The first was, are there any statistics around the um, total capacity for tanning in the UK at the minute. A lot of our members, probably very similar to Pasture for Life members, want to process their leather, but they can't. They've got to send it off to Italy, which undermines the story of what they're trying to do and how they're trying to farm. And the second thing was picking up on a point that Nikki said um, and the environmental impact of farming. You're producing leather goods that will sequest and lock away an amount of carbon, hopefully for a lifetime. Has there been any research or statistics on how much carbon is stored and captured in leather? Because we're kind of doing a lot of research in terms of how much carbon sequestration there is in wool. It'd be good to maybe link up on that. Um, I'm going to challenge that because I think we need to stop focusing always on how much carbon is locked up in that handbag or in that jumper because actually carbon cycles um, and carbon cycling is very normal. It's, you know, why we all are alive. <laughs> We're all made of carbon. So I think, yeah, I understand where you're coming from, but it's a, a marker or a, be a data set that could be used to try and sell something. My concern is that it's just an element of greenwashing and it plays to undermine people's understanding of what carbon actually is and that it's a it's the building blocks of life um, and I would be more interested in in how much time energy and effort we can put into re-educating people about carbon cycles as opposed to trying to make um, statements about you know that handbag sequesters x amount of carbon because ultimately it's not going to at some point it's going to break down and that carbon will be released and that's not a bad thing that's just ca the carbon cycle that's just life um, so yeah I get I get the the point of the question but I I think more effort could be put into actually helping people to understand what the carbon cycle is. Can I, I'm just going to quickly come in, this, come, on, come in on this as well. There's an interesting subplot in, in the leather carbon story, which is that leather may or may not 
eventually or is now being classed as a waste product which would neutralize its carbon emissions and actually the in the, the leather industry at the kind of at the big level is trying quite hard to have it classed as a waste product and essentially put all the emissions from animal farming onto the essentially onto the meat um, and that's something that I guess plays into all of this and is is probably one of the reasons why we need to be wary of carbon because it, you c it can be used for nefarious outcomes. I can respond a little bit to the first question, um, which <laughs> is also complex in the sense that, um, well, first of all, I don't think we know the the tanning capacity, Matthew. I don't know if that's something that you know, but but I, I don't I don't think there is an easy answer in terms of the um, tanning capacity in Britain, particularly for hides at least that are also coming from British farms. But what I would say is that um, we're so far away from even needing an answer to that question <laughs> because it's so complex for farmers um, to access the um, the tanning of hides, which is actually why we're doing what we're doing. So there is currently no effective service for farmers to send their hides independently and then to get that leather back or, or to know where it is. Excuse me? For sheepskins. Yeah, for, for sheepskins. Yeah, yeah. For, for sheep leather, we've got the organic tannery, but she so there that's correct. For demands sheepskins, much more than that. Yeah, of course it is, and those are those are sheepskins that are then turned into fleeces, which are suitable for rugs and for for putting over furniture. It's not, um, it's not a garment shearling, um, and it's not a sheep leather. I'm actually speaking just about cattle hides here, which is, um, you know, the um, capacity of the tannery that is contracting with us right now to provide that service is so much smaller than the available hides even from certified farms in Britain and that is because of the challenge that I mentioned before of the of the loss of that tanning infrastructure so that's just a sort of quick insight into into that question I'm afraid I think we are out of time unfortunately um, but we're going to be available to continue chatting so there's a few samples up here um, our tent pasture for life and British pasture leather are just right over there if you if you make a left as you're um, leaving this alley of the for the discussion tent please come and find us we're going to relocate to the to our booth and be available for more chatting and more discussion and thank you so much for being here <laughs>